It's a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon. Um, thank you for your patience, particularly for those that have hung in there and attending the last lecture of this uh, two-day summit. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, so we're sort of with you live. Uh, this is live when it was recorded, pre-recorded, because I'm in London at the moment. Um, what we're going to be looking at is um, waterproofing, and the subject that I was given by the organisers was waterproofing as the tip of the compliance iceberg. Now, the more I looked at it, the more it occurred to me that, in fact, it's more like it's the, the bottom of the iceberg because we've seen a lot of um, press about composite cladding and the fire issue, and quite rightly because of its immediate safety threat. But what's been happening in, industry, in the industry over many years now is that the, and lying below the surface and not getting the headlines, is the massive um, cost of rectification of waterproofing related issues in large scale residential and commercial buildings. So we're going to have a look at today is um, some of the examples of this type of issue, but also our efforts to gather some hard data on the extent, the nature and the cause of these issues, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So just to familiarise for those that aren't involved in the industry directly, the sort of things we're talking about is um, balconies um, leaching, such as this, which you, most people see on the highways as they drive by. Talk about um, leaching in uh, cases like this, this building, which is um, a building in Canberra which has about 150 units and has about $20 million worth of defects, mostly related to balconies, waterproofing, leaching and leaking. Um, so much so that the building was looked at for demolition and rebuilding, the extent of defects uh, that high. The second most frequent defect in this building is fire um, compliance issues. So we often see that waterproofing and fire are the two big issues um, in most of these high-rise residential problem projects. Also, wet areas, uh, dampness coming through from the shower area in particular to damage adjoining surfaces such as carpets and walls and surfaces. Or basements such as this major commercial building uh, where soon before the building was to open, uh, we did an assessment and found that there was over $100 million worth of work necessary to rectify damage from water to the substructure of this building. And this was before it had actually opened. And then of course, right throughout um, high-rise apartments, we see water damage to basement and basement walls. Um, it's difficult to look at data of compliance here because there's no Australian standard related to waterproofing in car parks and basements. And the Building Code of Australia, or NCC, specifically excludes it as a, an area of concern, which is quite alarming. So what we needed to do, um, what we've um, found right across the board in high-rise residential, is major problems related to balconies, related to falls, such as this in, in this balcony. And in this case, this lady had been living with sandbags on the outside of her sliding door for the last five years. Uh, they had had uh, something like six or seven consultants involved in trying to um, ascertain, fix the problem. And the sort of damage that she was having was extensive mould on the inside, damage of carpet. And these sandbags had been there so long that they'd started to break up and become sand again. This is the sort of mould um, extent. And this story is not infrequent. In fact, uh, a Strata manager colleague of mine that manages over 30,000 apartments states that um, every one of their major buildings in their portfolio have got extensive water penetration problems. So it's more the norm than the exception with these cases that I'm looking at here as being certainly the worst cases that we've come across, but they illustrate uh, what is happening in the industry at the moment. So. What happens is that in the construction phase, 
there's such complexity about how to resolve and address these things and so little hard data on why it occurs is that I'm frequently in this situation where you have contractors, subcontractors, architects, engineers in the middle of a project seeing that they can't make all the bits fit and then having to accommodate various products and systems on the run. And this is at the heart of the issue that we need to talk about. So, what data is available on the extent of the problem and then its cause and then its rectification? Well, there's a paucity of information available. There's research done here by University of New South Wales where they um, interviewed uh, 1,500 residents and found that the key issue of concern was internal water leaks, cracking to external internal structures and water penetration from outside generally. F by far and away the biggest issue to uh, residents. Interestingly, and we see that there's great data on new build uh, construction rates and so forth, but that's about the only research that's been done in a public domain about the performance of large-scale buildings in Australia. That's how little interest there is of the industry of the user experience compared to the build and opening kind of credits. We thought we'd address this in our own way by carrying out waterproofing audits of buildings and having a very detailed look. In fact, we, we asked 24 key questions with yes and no answers. We carried this out over six um, properties. A sample in this case that we're producing the data on is over 800 units, 1,100, uh, nearly 1,200 bathrooms and 559 balconies. Uh, the total amount of information recorded was 13, over 13,000 different answers or pieces of data in the um, audit process. The sorts of things we're looking at there is bathrooms such as this, where we would have a look at um, falls and compliance to the Australian standard on falls, provision of water stops, for example. We carried out a water test of the shower screen to see whether the shower screen leaked. We carried out an um, interview of the resident to see what their experience was of seeing leaks or damage to adjacent surfaces. We looked at it from two points of view. One is in terms of NCC requirements, which is that water should not be able to permeate out from a shower area and cause damage. So that's one criteria you'll see the results of. And the other criteria, quite separately, was that of compliance to the Australian standard, which is, as you, as you know, is a deemed to satisfy um, test, if you like. And we had a look at non-compliance with the, the relevant Australian standard. So we did this for bathrooms and balconies. In the case of balconies, we looked at levels we had a visual inspection of where damage occurred and again the user experience. We looked at in particular perimeter joints um, and intermediate joints in tiles because that's a precursor to massive uh, problem in the industry of tiles dislocating, peaking, tearing the membrane and causing um, major problem and the rectification is lot not light. The average unit might be ten, twenty thousand dollars to rectify a balcony membrane and tiling. So let's look first at bathrooms and the results of our audit. The um, compliance issue was rather interesting in that we see compliance to the Australian standard. We found, and bearing in mind that we're, this is a visual mostly of the top surface of the bathroom, this isn't demolition to, to have a look at how compliant the membrane was on the subsurface. But in terms of the surface um, um, aspects of compliance, we found 27% of the, the samples were non-compliant. We found that 73% um, on the surface was compliant. 
But in terms, when we look at leaking, and I look at that as in terms of the NCC requirement for um, bathrooms not to leak into adjacent areas, in fact, we find that 48% were non-compliant to NCC, 48% leaked. And that's um, about right for our anecdotal evidence across the board of uh, thousands of um, areas, is we find there's, um, the amount of leaking in bathrooms is to be huge. So if you think those results are alarming, let's have a look at this. The interesting aspect is that while we only had 27% as non-compliant to the Australian standard, we have 48% actually leaking. So we didn't see a correlation between non-compliance to the standard and a, ba and a bathroom leaking. In fact, our own experience is that uh, there's an equal chance of a bathroom failing if it complies to the Australian standard as if it doesn't. And for the reasons for that we'll come to later. So when we look at the total bathrooms with defects though, the figure becomes particularly alarming and see that we have 66% of bathrooms that we checked had defects of some sort or other. And that's consistent with what we find across the board. We can come to look at some explanations later, but in particular we have a look at the complexity of bathrooms these days. In a bathroom like this, in a new building, there might be 30 different changes of direction or details related to surface finishes. And of course, there's no, no, no longer hobs to be visible, there are unenclosed showers of, um, often, and the expectation of uh, users these days is of a much more streamlined design which incidentally takes away the waterproofing provisions. So when we open up a bathroom like this, when we do the deconstruction for forensic sort of analysis, and such as this bathroom where we have a look at it's an unenclosed type arrangement, on the underside of that glass um, blade wall, we see that there are in fact 36 different processes involved just at the bottom of a glass panel with the, tower, the tile on the shower this side and tile on the vanity side here of the different layers of membrane and soundproofing and topping and adhesive and all of these processes have to be done in situ perfectly for it to work and in this particular case we found that 90% of those processes hadn't been put in at the right place or in the right way, or the material was not capable of performing its designed role. In fact, we have done analysis on membranes, a commonly used membrane for wet areas and balconies, and in Canberra we found that there are only nine days of the year where that membrane, for its technical data sheet um, purposes, where there would be the relative humidity, the minimum surface temperature, and the surface moisture content in the concrete that enables that membrane to perform its designed function. We find very frequently that the membranes that are used across the board in wet areas and balconies, they may work well in a lab where the, con the, the items were tested, but they're not suitable for the site conditions that we normally find on a high rise or large scale building. And we come to balconies. Let's have a look at that. Balconies is the other major cost item. In this case, we found that in all the balconies inspected, only 20% of them were compliant. This is in terms of conformance with the relevant Australian standard, which is a mixture of both the uh, standard for membranes above ground use and also the standard related to ceramic tile installation. The primary non-compliance item with over 82% of non-compliance was the intermediate movement joint, and in fact movement joints around the perimeter as well, which is as provided by the ceramic tiling code. This is a critical item because we find that when these joints aren't provided, such as this situation with the tile butted up hard against the adjoining surface, we find that over three or four years, there is such growth in the tile and tile bed 
that we get it, the bulging or popping of the tiles in the middle, such as in this example, and it causes extensive inconvenience and cost for rectification. So, let's have a look at causes. Amongst the industry, they generally look at causes and say, well, it's um, workmanship and it's training. I disagree, and we find that in over 90% of the cases, we find that it's actually not so much a case of materials not being applied correctly, such as this in this um, corrugated iron roof where somebody imaginatively decided to run it crossways rather than long ways, which was plainly a case of not being applied according to the manufacturer's instructions. Um, I don't know whether the installer had a preference for that um, way of doing it. I can't imagine the architect saying I'd prefer to run horizontally, but clearly it doesn't, um, it's not very good for flow. Um, and it's a wonderful example of um, somebody not reading the instructions before they started. That's not generally the case of what we find in this membrane world. 90% of defects in our experience have their origins in design. And when we mean design, well, we talk about design issues as being when somebody's thinking about something before they put it in. Um, maybe the uh, architect um, originated design. Very often we find the developers got a major influence on design. They are the ones that often determine floor to ceiling height, for example. And floor to ceiling height is one of the biggest influences on balcony failure that we find. So we then have the builder these days, of course, with design and construct contracts, becomes the quasi-designer. Interestingly, because most builders that I know of have never had a day's training in design, but they are now responsible for running the design team and often designing things on the run. An example of how design is a major influencer, rather than just the membrane installer, or the tiler. In this case, we've got ponding and a balcony. And when I came involved in the project, there was everybody was lamenting the poor quality of um, ceramic tile uh, tradesmen and their unreliability in the fact that there was ponding on this balcony. But in fact, what we found on this um, balcony when we did the analysis is that there was such significant deflection in the concrete slab in some parts in this building, there was over 180 millimetres of deflection of these cantilevered slabs throughout the building, which leads, lit shows indicates ponding such as this. Now, in this case, we probably had about 50, 60 millimetres of deflection in this balcony. So now we have, uh, this is only after two or three years. So now we have water running away from the outlet to the corner it would appear that that balcony was placed to the correct falls when it was first installed. But somewhere along the line, the engineer didn't tell somebody about the expected deflection to be had in that balcony. And this is what we find in the workshops all, all the way when we're doing new construction. Um, engineers tend to keep that a secret. What is the deflection or the amount of movement that they expect in a, in a structure, as if it doesn't matter to anyone else? But in this case, we have exceptional movement of this up to 180 mil, and we find that quite frequently is for deflections in slabs and um, elements to be greater than what was expected. But when we talk to the engineer, he say, oh, it's within the um, AS3600, within the code. But in fact, as far as water is concerned, it doesn't listen to the code, it just runs away from the outlets. So situations such as this, when we analyse a balcony, it's easy to blame the membrane installer, perhaps. But in fact, it's an amalgam of the engineer's input about deflection, the architect's allowance for floor-to-ceiling height, or the developer's allowance for floor-to-ceiling height, that allows you to, the tiler to get falls in the correct uh, dimension and the correct amount of slope to run the water away. So we can see straight away that there are two or three Australian standards involved in this process, not just one. So in case somebody says, oh, we've just got to improve the writing of the standards, it's in fact a complex array of three or four different or five processes. In fact, we see in new designs that contour maps 
are very um, useful for understanding where the deflections are going to be so that we make sure that water is running towards outlets over time because it's a 10 year point that we need the deflection maps for rather than running away. Also in structures such as these, a roof structure, to have the framing in such a way that it will withstand the weight of water and not deflect downwards in such a way. Or in the case of uh, this um, particular element where an, a leak was occurring repeatedly and in fact we found that in that structure where the leak was running into a hospital um, below, that there was 40 millimetres, 40 millimetres of um, expansion movement in the expansion joint predicted by the engineer at the time of the construction, which he didn't share with any of the other people. So we had a membrane trying to expand across 40 millimetres of uh, movement joint. We can see in new construction such as this, just within two months, we have six millimetre joints opening up to which a liquid membrane is never capable of bridging. But they are sold throughout the country, liquid membranes for such applications. We just ask too much of these waterproofing products, sealants and membranes. We, they're oversold for a wide range of applications. They might be good in one application, but they're often sold in six or ten and the materials just can't handle the loads that are placed upon them. So the result is that we have meetings like this on the top of roofs on a regular basis where everybody's looking at everybody saying, well, where did it go wrong and what should we do about it? This is the, a frequent meeting, not had before the project, but often at completion of the job or a few years after with everybody looking at each other and wondering where the responsibility lies. So that's the complexity of the issue, of the way we see it. It's no one single Australian standard. It's no one single act of compliance. It's actually more to do with the habits of the industry, where it's focused about getting the building built and finished. There's very little focus on the user experience and the life of the systems after the fact. There's very little focus on what shape and size the building is going to be after 10 years in terms of deflection and um, shrinkage of concrete. These are the issues that um, are at the heart of this, the bottom of the iceberg, if you like. And I uh, hope that our discussion today might um, broaden the range of the discussion for future summits such as this to look at these questions in more detail. So it's a pleasure being with you today. If, if only virtually, and um, look forward to some of your questions later. Thank you.